Hey, I'm Joe Farrow with Geek Toolkit. In this episode, we're gonna talk about how to build this little guy. This is a beautiful little arcade cabinet called the Pi Score. This was released on Tested on a show called Bits to Atoms by Sean Charlesworth and Jeremy Williams. They released it in about 2018, and when I went to go build it, there were a couple of things I hit that I had to update. I wanna talk about the things I learned building this, some of the changes I made, and some of the new 3D models I made to make sure that I supported the new components. That's all in this episode of Geek Toolkit, so here we go. I have wanted a little miniature arcade cabinet since I was a kid. There was a version of this that was put out by Coleco. There was a Frogger and a Pac-Man and actually a new re-release, Rainbow Bright and Robotron, I think just recent release, which I'm gonna probably have to go find, but they're just cool. I just think they're cool. And I saw them on a Facebook group called Old Made New by a gentleman named Neil Henry. He has a ton of these that he makes, does the artwork and all sorts of stuff. They're beautiful decals and such. And I always wanted one. Now, Neil Henry, he's taking the old ones and putting Raspberry Pis in to break, bring the game forward, which is awesome. But on Tested, they created one that was basically 3D printed with Raspberry Pi. There's a bit to cover here and I learned a lot. So the way I'm gonna break this down is basically by the components. So we'll talk about the 3D print and some of the tips and the redesign I did. Then we're gonna talk about the controller and how the controls go on and a little bit about the N30 Pro 2, which is the 8-bit um, dough controller that's used here. But see, the thing is, if you haven't watched the, the tested video yet, what they did is they reproduced the controller sh shell into this front piece here, which is an absolutely beautiful way to do it because all of these buttons feel great. But there's some pro tips I learned after 3D printing it, so we'll talk about that. We're also gonna talk about the display on this. This is a five inch LCD display, which I had to recreate the bezel. So I'll talk about how I did that and how the display goes on. We'll talk a little bit about the Raspberry Pi. I went down to a Raspberry Pi A+. I'll talk about why I did that and some of the benefits there. We're gonna talk about the audio system, which was very impressive for me. The, the audio has stereo speakers on both sides. These are speaker grills on the side here. So it has speakers on both sides. And then we'll talk about the power system. So this is my on off switch. And then uh, this is the charge port. It's got a battery system in here. I'm not sure how many hours it lasts yet. Absolutely amazing, amazing system. And we're gonna get into it right now, starting with the 3D printing. This is all the parts splayed out. And what we'll do is we'll walk through all of the different things. We're gonna start out with 3D printing um, and talk about the 3D printed parts and some of the tips to get them printed successfully some of the settings. Now there is a 3D print part sheet that talks about what should have supports, what shouldn't, and how to orient them, but I'll walk you through it really quick. This is what's called the hood. The hood can, it's by default prints on its back, but that requires a bigger printer. So you have a smaller printer, you can print it like this, both ways without supports. He did a beautiful job with a 45 degree, um, you know, angle here. And the reason I keep saying 45 degree, it's either 45 or less, but what that does, is that means that you don't need supports to do overhangs and such. The same like if you print it like this, the printer can actually come out and print this, this front bezel piece because of the way he's designed it. So that's all done on purpose. The original one was injection molded, so they didn't have to worry about that. So when you convert it to 3D printing, just a really well done job. Again, you, you can see it here too. If you print it like this, he's got that, that angle there and that's what these angles are about. It's just to make sure that you print it without supports. Speaking of supports, this is the frame for the monitor. So this goes like this, this is the bottom, the base. This snaps in on the back here. It's got these little pegs. You print these pegs separately, you print six of them. But you can see you've got a couple of press fit parts that have to actually fit very well and very tightly together. That's why you wanna make sure your printer's calibrated. He's a calibration cube. What you do is you print that and measure it. It should be 20 millimeters all the way around. And if so, then you know you've got things dialed in. This is the controller holder. Gotta be careful, <laughs> so my buttons don't fall out. But you can see the buttons are here. We'll talk about that a little bit more on the controller. This one here was a bit tight for me. I ended up having to sand this and grind it out. Part I wanna talk about here is he's got these pegs on these four pegs. They match right here. 
And so what happens is when this flips over and you press this down and you slide it down, it locks in, which is really, really satisfying. This is probably the biggest piece. Actually, it is the biggest piece. Um, it prints basically in that orientation, just like that. No supports, sidewalls, everything go up well. It's got a little bit of a trickiness with the speaker grill here. Again, if you don't do supports, you should be fine there. I did a light sanding and then I did a just a Rust-Oleum primer paint. I'm gonna cover mine with vinyl. If you're only expecting to paint it, I recommend that 0.2 layer, millimeter layer height, sand it really well down, uh, maybe a filler primer, but that'll give you a nice, nice finish. Go down to about 220 grit. And then if you really want to smooth it out, get it down to 400, you should have a good finish. So the audio board, is in this base part right here. And it's this piece right here that's got a knob. Basically what you do is you buy this board, it comes with the knob, the board here, and then it, the, the thing I'll link actually has two speakers that are designed for it, which is really nice. That way you don't have to do any guessing or ohm matching or any craziness like that. You basically get your amplifier, you get your board. Now it is an amplifier and it is a powered amplifier, so you're gonna need power to it. So again, I used one of these fancy cables Let's see, uh, this fancy cable right here, which is, um, you can see I'm coming off the power of the Raspberry Pi screen. I'll talk about power in a second, and that powers the board. You're gonna have three wires that come off and go to the Raspberry Pi. That's gonna be for ground left and right. And then you're gonna have four wires, two each for each speaker that come off that board. That board does take a significant amount of power. And one thing about it is the knob will actually click when it's off. So you can turn it all the way to one side and you'll hear it click. That means it's off. So one thing I've learned about this is if it's off all the way and I boot the Raspberry Pi and then turn it on, the power surge will basically turn the Raspberry Pi off in my current power setup. So be aware of that. But it is handy to know that if you want to save battery, you've got the ability to not only control volume, but to turn it off. And the volume control, I believe, is a change from the original design to have that ability to change the volume on the fly, which is nice. Not much else to say about audio other than this thing gets loud and it sounds great. Other than that, there's not much to say. This is basically a headphone jack cable that I cut the ends off and it had three wires inside. I pulled them out, stripped them, soldered them here and soldered them on the other end. So it's not a special cable. It's, it was just real easy to do. That's it for audio. Let's talk about the controller. The first thing I wanna talk about is what is the controller? It's actually an 8-bit Doe N30 Pro V2. It looks like this before you will take it apart and take all the buttons out of it. Basically pop off the black back plate, take the screws out, take all the parts out, and then you're gonna transfer them over to this print here. The buttons are really nice. They're keyed so they only fit one way. So when you put them in and you get them fit in there, they'll be, you'll get your XYAB classic setup. The heights and everything are dialed in. He did an amazing job modeling this. It's very beautifully done. This right here is for a power switch if you wanna use that. This here are notches, they fit on here. And then this will go and slide, you'll press in and slide down. This is the innards. This is what the inner inside of this looks like. It's got four shoulder buttons. If you wanna keep those, make sure you desolder them and don't pry them off like I did. If you pry them off, you'll tear the solder pads. If you desolder them, you can wire them up to side buttons. You can have them on here and add about four more buttons for your shoulders on both sides, you could have two. It's great for like pinball or any games like that, or if you're gonna do Super NES or some kind of emulators like that. But for me, I'm just doing arcade, four buttons is plenty. It's a USB-C controller, but I use it as Bluetooth. I use the USB-C part though to charge it. And be aware the controller does have a battery, which is really handy. It keeps the Bluetooth pairing and all the info. This piece is one of the 3D printed parts. This will go like that and press that together. See how that presses on there? And so when you put the controller in, this crossbar locks everything down. One note on the buttons, a pro tip when you're putting this all together is when you get this far, you start pressing the buttons down, they should just kind of go down and not grind. If you feel them grinding or if you feel them get stuck or if you, they press and stay in, then what you wanna do is take the button out and grind it out. I use a, a little like mini Dremel thing like this. this is a cheap harbor freight tool. It's like 10 bucks, it's been great. You use a full size Dremel, whatever you need. Basically some kind of tool, even a knife, but basically you're gonna wanna carve the inner circle out to widen a little bit. His tolerances are just a little bit tight and it can get a little bit sticky. You never want a button to stick, so. Little pro tip for that there. One other pro tip that's super important, uh, and when I say pro tip, that means I screwed it up and I want you to not, is this is the Bluetooth pairing button. So when you get this all assembled, then I would build the rest of the cabinet, and then before you put this piece on, press that button when this is powered, and pair Bluetooth with whatever OS or whatever you got going on here. I used RetroPie, I went into the Bluetooth menu and paired it. 
super important that you do that then because once this is on there's no way to hit that button from inside you see how it's it's not exposed up front anywhere it's it's in the middle there so be aware of the bluetooth all right and that's it for controllers this is my screen this is a wave share five inch screen it's got a breakout for your pins off your hd or off your raspberry pi your pins will go into here and then it comes with this piece here, which is a low profile HDMI, basically replaces an HDMI cable. So it ends up being very low profile. It also places the, the Raspberry Pi right behind it, like a backpack. And then when you put that into here, your entire compute and screen system are only about this tall. So it actually places everything up in the air, which is nice. Gives you a lot of room for battery packs. I've chosen to do all my powering via pins because when you put this together, you'll see everything is kind of tight on the sides. There's not a lot of, of gaps. And even on the top, there's not a lot of gaps. There's a lot of room below, but not on the side. So I run everything out of these wires and then I can assemble stuff and build basically down off of this into the case. For the Raspberry Pi, I used a Raspberry Pi 3A+. I took the audio port off and I soldered wires directly to it. There's three wires. They soldered these three back pins right here. And one on the side is gonna be ground. The other two will be left and right. Basically what I did is I got my software on there, booted it up, tested the speakers and found out what wire needs to go where. But it really wasn't that hard. Once this is desoldered off, and for this one I actually took pliers and ripped it off and it ripped off clean took off a couple of parts and was good to go. The Raspberry Pi A plus is significantly smaller than the B plus. Here's what the B plus looks like. It takes less power. It's got a little bit less memory. It's about half of the memory at one point. But the thing is it runs everything I care about just fine, especially something I'm gonna be putting on a portable. The big problem here were these ports here were just really bulky and they were sticking out the back and I wasn't getting a lot of benefit, so I chucked it. I did do a prototype where I cut the back out, but it was ugly, so I just bailed on the whole problem. Now the A+, everything about it, if you haven't seen one of these, runs just like a Raspberry Pi. You can get them for about $25 instead of $35 base price. They are a little bit harder to find right now. I had to actually order mine through the UK, so that might be due to COVID, I'm not sure. That's why I went with the A+. Uh, there's not much else to say about that other than just noting it and noting the modification for the audio. Everything else is gonna be stock on it. Do make sure that you've got a heat sink on it though because you're going to be running it hot with this. Okay, so let's talk about power. And I'm probably going to spend the most time on this, but it's incredibly important, not only for this project, but any Raspberry Pi project where you want to power Raspberry Pi via battery pack, especially if you're pulling a lot of accessories off of it. The Raspberry Pi, even the A+, that takes a bit less power, you want about 2.4, 2.5 amps to be supplied to it. You want that available at a minimum. This screen, the spec on the screen says at least three amps. And so now you start getting up there in amperage. You need something that's pretty fairly powerful. And we want to power the Raspberry Pi, the screen. We also need something to charge this. Now this has its own battery, so this is going to be a trickle charge, but it is another power draw. And finally, the amplifier is powered. And they're all five volt systems, all of them. The batteries are 3.7 volt systems. This is what the batteries look like. These are called 18650s. So in between this and that five volt system, we need something to boost the power, uh, which is typically called a boost converter. We also need a charging circuit because we wanna be able to plug this in and charge it. We also want pass-through charging, which means not only do we wanna plug it in and charge it, but we wanna be able to still use it while it's being charged. All of that is in this Adafruit chip that's called an PowerBoost 1000C. That chip's $20 US, but it is incredibly versatile because it does all of that and then a few other things. It's got an enable disable pin. And what that means is that you can hook up a two pin switch or even a three pin switch off to it if you want a slide switch. And then when you activate those two pins, it turns it on. So that means you can have an on off switch that turns your power off right at the base. This basically cuts battery power when I cut this, which is really handy. Now we are running a Raspberry Pi. You want to shut it off appropriately but then being able to cut power means that things like the amplifier is not still drawing power even though the Raspberry Pi is not on. This battery pack here is three 18650 cells, basically wrapped up with electrical tape with two leads coming off. So let's talk about the battery real quick. This is an 18650 battery. Looks like a giant AA. Here's a AA battery to show you size and this is a AAA. These 18650s are incredibly popular. I didn't realize that a lot of laptop batteries, if you rip them apart, they're actually just a bunch of these put in there. They come in various sizes. This one says 1200 milliamps. This is how much it can store. Uh, they come up into about 35, 3600 milliamp hours. I've seen them say 9,000 milliamp hours. And from what I understand, that's a scam and something to watch out for when you're buying these batteries. 
what they do is sometimes they'll what they'll do it's called unwrapping they'll get the battery from like let's say samsung or somebody that's that's a decent supplier they'll cut the edge off and they'll rewrap them with a new, new label that says some other ridiculous number so be aware read the reviews when you buy these batteries make sure you're getting it now the the important thing there is if i got 3600 milliamp batteries and i built a new battery pack I could triple my, my, basically my battery here, or I could get a four or five. I mean, you see, I have a lot of room here. I could probably get a four or five to fit in here um, and really have the battery capacity of this thing go up. And that's just, that's cool. It's good to understand how that works. This, uh, this, this three battery holder here, you actually have to wire it up yourself. And the reason being is batteries work in two ways as far as, well, circuits in general. You know what's called parallel, which is where I connect these up uh, on the end, and then this becomes my positive, this becomes my negative. If I do parallel, then my capacity will triple, but I'll still be a 3.7 volt uh, supply here. It won't it won't triple my, my voltage, just my capacity. If I do serial, where I go back and forth on here, and then do a negative and a positive lead coming off, then that will keep my 1200 milliamp capacity, so the battery will only last that long, but it'll triple my voltage. So I'll have three times the power coming out, for the same amount of time. In this case, I want it to be at 3.7 volts because I already have an up converter to five, but I want to increase the capacity. So I just did these as parallel. Okay, so that's cool because now you understand power, you can understand how to power Raspberry Pi and understand that you have to push the, the basically the supply the amperage. The power boost amperage rating, I am not clear on. It says one amp, but that's actually the charging portion of it. The output of it, I'm not sure what it can pull. I think it's just passing the battery through from what I can tell. But I do know that if you have a surge, it will take the, the Raspberry Pi down. So that's what I can say about power. When you use this, this turns off. Let's see. That click. So what I would do is when I'm done, I turn it off. And when I turn it back on, I actually turn this on and turn it up a little bit. And then I flip my power. And then that, there's no surge coming off the audio. And we don't end up with a, basically like browning out the Raspberry Pi and rebooting it. If the Raspberry Pi starts rebooting over and over, that means your batteries are low. As the voltage of the batteries goes down, they, they start out charged at like about 4.2 volts for these batteries. As it goes down, the amperage that they can supply goes down with them. And eventually your Raspberry Pi just won't be able to keep up, even though the battery's got some charge left in it. So be aware of that as well. If you start having problems uh, where the Raspberry Pi is constantly rebooting, just give your battery a charge. Make sure it's not a low battery system. Here's one last thing I want to talk about for just power. What I've done here is I've actually cut the wire that goes to the battery. I've cut the positive cable in half, and then I've hooked a digital multimeter in between that and set it to measure amps. What this is doing is actually showing me the current coming through the Raspberry Pi. And it's set to um, the digital multimeter set such that the decimal point is everything to the left is amps. So we're drawing about... 680 to 720 milliamps right now. This actually surprised me because I was always under the impression that a Raspberry Pi was drawing two amps or more, and that's why you need the big beefy 2.4 amp power supply. But from what I'm seeing on this, if I'm reading this correctly, it's actually drawing less than an amp here, which lines up with some of the stuff I looked at when I was looking up how much the Raspberry Pi A plus draws. It's about 100 milliamps less than the Raspberry Pi 3B. So it's actually quite a bit of efficiency when you realize that, you know, even running a game, you're only at about 700 milliamps. I just wanted to show this because I was curious about this and it took me a while to set it up and it's kind of a destructive thing to set up. So by me providing you this data, if you do want to know what the amp ratings are, this will help you with quite a bit. This is measuring the screen, the amplifier, and the Raspberry Pi. This is not measuring the amp draw off of recharging the controller, but I would expect that to be nominal. Next thing we're going to go into is the wiring diagram. Okay, here's a power diagram I threw together. The PowerBoost 1000C has a micro USB port on it. You could plug a wall ward into it or anything that you want that would normally charge like an Android phone, and that will charge the battery that's connected. The battery connects either via JST or a pin. For mine, I'm connected to the JST connector, which is this two pin connector right here. Coming off of this are two power cables that are powering the rest of the system. One goes up to the 8-bit DOE controller. It's actually a, a power cable that goes into a micro USB, and then the micro USB goes into a USB B to C adapter, and that powers the 8-bit DOE. 
That keeps the battery on it charged. The 8 controller communicates with the Pi over what Bluetooth for mine, so that saves me having to do any signal connection there. The other power cable goes into the WaveShare LCD display, and from the display, we actually power everything else. So please notice there's nothing going into the Raspberry Pi from the power boost. It goes through the LCD display, and then the LCD display through the GPIO pins powers the Raspberry Pi. The other breakout on the WaveShare LCD display is used to power the audio board. The WaveShare LCD and the Raspberry Pi communicate over a loopback HDMI signal. So that's how the, the video gets there. Some of these onboard LCD displays have a different way of connecting. For this one, it's actually HDMI in. Also coming off the Raspberry Pi, this analog is ripped off, this analog audio output, and there's three wires coming off of it that goes over to the audio board. The three wires are ground left and right. The audio board also has plus and minus for left and right speakers. So it's probably the most busy thing on the entire wiring diagram because of having power, four wires for the speakers, and three wires coming in for audio. That's the entire wiring diagram and how I put things together, and hopefully that helps you out if you build this. It helps you kind of lay things out and understand where things connect to what. It's not necessarily the only way to do it, but it's how I chose to do it, and it's worked well for me. I will speed up the parts that are boring and slow down the parts that are relevant. First thing you want to do is make sure your power boost is inserted on the back here. Make sure your USB is visible. This should lock in because this case was made for the power boost to be there. I drilled through and mounted my power switch and my knob here. I'll show you the wiring diagrams for those, but have those all wired in. Your battery pack can kind of go anywhere. It's going to have plenty of room here. You can double stick tape it to hold it down once you have it placed. First thing we're going to do is work on the Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi, we're going to take it flip it over and line up the HDMI ports. Once you have those lined up, then you'll have an idea where your pins go. And then we're just gonna insert the pins here. Take this right here and insert it here. This is gonna be your HDMI wraparound. It's a very slick thing to have. Okay. This right here goes down. It goes, it goes towards the front, I should say. These legs go towards the back. So the way this works here, is like that. You can know, you can flip it over and make sure your bezel is not showing um, you know, too much. If it's upside down, looks like that, it looks like crap. So you might have a little bit showing, that's fine, we can handle it later. Once that's on, you just have a crossbar like this. The crossbar press fits and then it just friction holds that up against the screen, up against the front there. All right. Remember, one of these is going to power the Raspberry Pi, and one of these is going to run off and power the amplifier. So that is the power to the Raspberry Pi. The amplifier should have one coming off of it. So you can see that there's the amplifier. Here's the wire for that. Thank you so much for watching this. I want to thank Sean Charlesworth and Jeremy Williams for putting this together because this project has just been, like I said, a dream of mine. And as you can see these gameplay videos, I am having a blast with this. I really appreciate all the support and I will get all of the links in the description below for things like the STL files and what I basically what I'm using on my kit. If you have any questions, please put them in below. And if you're looking to join a community and you're on Facebook, look for the 3D printed arcade community. That's basically where I'm at in sharing what I've learned and also where others have been teaching me how to put this together. I really appreciate of that community. Thanks so much. I'm Joe Farrow with Geek Toolkit. And until next time.